and uh, did a lot of good things out there, a lot to learn from. The guys were um, appreciative of the things that we need to get corrected, uh, but we also saw a lot of the good things. And uh, we're excited about going on the road versus another conference opponent in Charlotte, uh, a venue I've never been to versus a team that we've never played, a team that has won two of their last three games, a team that has won most recently at Tulsa, which uh, Memphis Tiger fans know that is a very difficult thing to do. They also won on the road at East Carolina. Uh, they've got multiple quarterbacks they play, which we know has uh, given us issues uh, in the past. Um, and they've got a lot of talent. They've got 10 of their 11 starters on defense or transfers. Nine of those 11 are power five. Um, they look very similar to a lot of the rest of the teams in our conference and some of those that we've played at a power five level. They're very talented. Uh, we're gonna have to be great this week in our preparation and we're gonna get ready for the Charlotte opponent. Get the obvious questions out of the way. Do you have any injury updates starting with Seth? Yeah, Seth will be day to day um, to, to figure it out. But you know, obviously we don't practice today, so we'll have a better understanding as the week progresses. Um, if he can't go, then we got great faith in Tevin Carter and the rest of our quarterbacks um, to be able to run our offense and handle our offense. Obviously, we'll we'll judge Seth on a day to day basis. Obviously, Blake Watson, same deal, day to day. See if he can go, um, and we'll continue to look at it as we monitor the rest of our team. And then as you go back and look at the film, you know, what did you see on the second look from, from the defense? Yeah, so you, know, you look out there and you see, uh, obviously, the point total is never what you wanted. But you look and say, okay, what was it? And uh, I believe it was the opening drive, right? We force a fumble on the quarterback. And literally, the ball pounces you know, directly into um, one of their linemen's hands. And you, you think, man, the, the misfortune of one of those things. Had that gone the other way? Um, you look at some of the other things that occurred. Julian Barnett did a great job breaking on the ball. Had he caught it in the hand, that would have been another interception. Um, a fourth down stop where he got him, and they end up converting, right? A, a third down where he had him dead to the rights, which would have turned into a third and 16 uh, on a missed tackle on a sack. And we looked at those missed opportunities to start with more than anything, and the four major missed opportunities actually turned into touchdown drives for them. Um, and so we know that they're a capable offense. But had those opportunities gone the other way, it may have been a, a different story. And so uh, looking back upon those things, you say, okay, how do we you know, find ways, one, to make the most of those opportunities, and then two, you know, limit the explosive plays. Uh, we did give those up and we looked at it. And um, what I appreciate about our staff is they're all working diligently to find ways to get it fixed. And it starts with me um, and how we can fix that. And the, the players also sit there and say, okay, these are the things we gotta get better. Um, obviously the blocked punt is inexcusable, put our defense in a bad situation. So you start to look at some of those things. Um, may, maybe the, the scoreboard would have been a little bit more reflective of things that we're capable of. Um, and we, we weren't able to maximize those opportunities. And that's something we're going to have to do going forward. And we continue to find ways to get the ball taken away, like we were able to do in the second half versus UAB, and continue to play at a high level and limit the explosives. And then on the other end, your offense combined for over 100 points these last two weeks. What do you like in the way that they just Clicking. Keyword clicking, right? You guys have heard me searching, and, and every and I say it because I, you know, I think we're as college football continues to progress, we're looking at every head coach in the country is looking for consistency, and I think we're starting to see some of that by our offense, right? Okay, hey, if, if the run game's not there, then the pass game is, and we got to win our one on ones. Okay, if they're taking away the pass game, then are we able to hand the ball off and run the ball effectively? And I think that's what you want um, to be balanced on your offense, to be able to be consistent. And we're going to take what defense gives us. Obviously, we'll be smart. We'll continue to be um, attack them and, and be aggressive. But um, having an understanding of the things we got to continue to get better at. I'm still not happy with where we are on third down as an offense. Um, but to sit there, you know, I think if you look at the first three quarters, Seth Hennigan may have played his best game of the season. I played really clean, really well. Um, I thought the guys, you know, we talked about even post game, you got some of the wide receivers that won those one-on-one -on -one battles when challenged in man coverage or, or, or you know, th some type of three rotation. And um, I was just pleased by the effort by everybody there, but we need to do it, right? That's two weeks. How can we make it a third week and continue to push in the right direction? Yeah, look, uh, I've, I've always had such admiration and respect uh, for so many of the sports around here, but let, let's call it what it is. Our, our women's soccer team, what they've been able to accomplish, what Coach Brooks and his staff have been able to do, um, not just one year, but a multitude of year after year after year, 
not since, since I've been here, but long before I was even here, he's done it at such a high level and the culture he's been able to create is outstanding. And so I've actually, at one time, you know, I'll, I'll go out there in the middle of the mornings and there's only one other group out there. It's usually the women's soccer team and they're, they're out there running and working and they, they outwork almost every program um, at the university and they just do such a tremendous job. So I've even, I've, I've talked to our team about, look, this is a team that's consistent, that does it the right way. And I think that there's few football programs or fo football coaches that have the confidence in themselves and their players to sit there and say, okay, here's our women's soccer team. Look at all these wonderful things they're doing, the way they work, the way they'll handle themselves. And this is what we need to strive for. And so, um, absolutely, I think it's a, it's a great motivating factor. Um, I'm just so pleased with their success. They certainly earned it and, and continue to wish them well the rest of the season. But anytime we can look within our own athletic department and see success, see people doing it the right way, um, it's great, and it's a great thing for us to, to admire and, and to strive for, um, and we'll continue to push in that direction. You kind of hit on it a little bit before, but USF loaded up the box to take Blake away, and then Demir and Rock combined for over 300 yards between the two of them. How encouraging is it, everyone's focused on Blake, to know that when a defense commits to taking him away, you guys do have the answer? Yeah, I think that's part of the key, and, and Matt, that even goes back to even like preseason when you guys said, Ryan, like, wh where are your weapons going to come from? Who's going to step up um, when so many of those guys that were leading and receiving categories are no longer with the program? And I said, I, I, I've got great faith in who we had on the roster, and then you know, even through spring, that guys would step up, and, uh, and you know, it is it's uh, you know credit to those young men that have found ways to win those one-on-one -on -one battles. You know, and even let's go back, and, and I, I do, you know, talked about you guys had the opportunity to talk to Rock post game, and obviously a fantastic young man. You guys could just hear me oozing out uh, my appreciation and love for him, but a, a young man like Demir Blankensee, uh, who had two crucial drops at North Texas, and to come back, and the easy thing is to say, okay, we don't believe in him, we don't have faith in him, and I mean, you guys saw what he was able to do in the first quarter and make some explosive plays, so I think that just shows. Um, we got great faith in every single one of our skill guys. Uh, no different, um, right, with the emergence of a Sutton Smith and a, a Brennan Thomas. It's it's pleasing. Uh, Tevin Carter, right? I mean, Tevin goes in. And I know you guys will say, again, we talked about it. You know, the, the first play is a, a touchdown throw, but that's the confidence and belief we have in our guys. And it, so much has to do with the preparation uh, that the young men put in uh, day in and day out. When you prepare for Charlotte, do you go back to Michigan with, with Pogge? you go to his high school team? How do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because later in the season there's a significant sample size, um, generally we can look at this season alone. It's usually if, hey, if it's the first, second, or third, fourth game, then you're, you're scrambling to decide, okay, what else is out there on them, especially when it's a new staff. Um, we have studied some uh, of these places where some of their coordinators have been because I think that's important. You have to uh, get a feel for what other things do they have up their sleeve, whether it's pressures, tricks, all those things. And we do that every week, right, to try to study these opponents and figure out what else, um, what else is in their system, what's the book on them, and get a feel for them. Um, but, you know, I think one of those things, you're seeing a team in Charlotte that's getting better every week. And sometimes it may not reflect on the scoreboard, but they've won two of the last three games. And winning football is, is hard, and they did two of those on the road versus conference opponents. And uh, like I said, we know how hard it is to win at ECU. We know how hard it is to win at Tulsa. And for them to come away with an overtime win, it speaks volumes. And they actually uh, were up 14 points middle of the second quarter on Maryland, at Maryland. So, I mean, they, they're doing some things at a, a high level. Um, and they've got players. I mean, they've got freaking players. And so we, we've got to have our best week. It's the most important game of the season for us. Um, and we understand what's at stake. We know that, obviously, Tevin came in and had that Um, you know, maybe we'll spend a little bit more time kind of discussing some of the things, um, it, whether he's the, the starter or, or the backup again. Um, he's going to prepare the same way. But some of those conversations may be, okay, hey, what do you feel comfortable with? Not, not too often do you ask the backup what are their top plays. But then sometimes, like I've told you guys, you guys have asked before in preparation, like how does that work with Seth and, and his growth? Um, now th those conversations may occur with Tevin. Okay, what are some of the things you feel comfortable with? What uh, first play of the game? What do you What do you like? What What's going to make you happy? Is it a Oh, you want to throw the ball down the field for you know big play? Do you want to hand the ball off? Do you want a quarterback run it? Uh, do we want to run the triple option? 
Um, and so I'm going to have those conversations with him throughout the week and, and see where his comfort level's at. And uh, if he ends up being the guy, we'll have great confidence in him. Do you have right. an idea of when, obviously, with any injury, you never really know, but with a quarterback, is there like a, this game, we have an idea just so we can put the game plan in because it might be different? Or is it go up until maybe red play? That's a great question. Um, I think because we've got great faith in both. We've got great faith in all of our quarterbacks, um, but we know that's what Seth is capable of, and so it may literally be a game time decision. Now, we may know tomorrow there's no chance Seth is playing. We may know tomorrow, oh, Seth's good to go. Um, so to give that answer, but I think with a lot of those things, you know, if, if your signal caller has been a starter for a few years, um, you want to give it as much time as possible. Um, but you also don't want to dampen the ability to do what you need to in a game plan because of holding out hope or saying, hey, we got to limit this and that. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that as the week goes. I don't think we'll uh, game plan much differently because uh, of the way our offense is and what we can do uh, without giving away things schematically. We'll, we'll have some different answers regardless, like we would if it's a different running back, a different quarterback, different uh, tight end package. Um, but, you know, the, we'll see. And, and I, I truly don't know when I'll have an answer, and that's not to be – Coy from the local media, you guys have been so great to us. It's just a well, only time will tell, and it may be a day-to-day -day thing. How, how right. do you think that is on the on the back of quarterback on Carter, who you know he did come in, had played since the first game to shot through that ball. But how for preparation stuff, you know, how, how does that affect him? Not really know. Well, here's the deal. He is a true pro for a young man. I mean, he's. Had it been a, a maybe a young man with a more fragile mindset and not the approach um, like he has, he's going to come up here just like he does every week and prepare like he's a starter. And so um, he understands the situation. And so um, if he gets a nod, he's going to do a phenomenal job. Um, and if he says, hey, we're not sure, maybe even the morning, he'll be great. He'll be prepared. Um, and if that's the guy, he'll be out there dialed in, locked in, just like he was in that game. If his number's called, he'll be ready. Um, and it, that's those two, you know, their roommates on the road, their relationship is huge. Uh, their conversations, not just about football, uh, and they support one another. So if it's Tevin out there, I promise you, Seth will be the bright eyed and helping in any way, shape, or form, just like he was, and no different than if Tevin's, you know, if Seth's out there, Tevin's the same way. And um, so that's where, you know, regardless of what happens, um, great confidence that their, their mental, for lack of a better term, will be a okay. Ryan, two things real quick. If Seth can't go, who's Tevin's backup? To be determined this week, I to think. Be yeah, I think that's part of because um, once the season gets going, we still get our other guys' reps. It's not like, oh, but you're also limited on time. So we're not sure. out there for four hours of practice saying, okay, hey, number three, number four, you guys get all the reps. So a lot of that has been for them mental and, you know, sometimes in the back kind of going through the motion. So, um, obviously, those guys may get more work this week, and, and I, I don't have that determination today. Okay. Second of all, get, going back to the defense and, and the defensive issues, we see it across the board in college football, other than maybe Iowa. There's defensive issues. Is it because the, the, the offense is that much ahead of the defense? Is it because of the rules that certainly you know, help the offense and protect the quarterback? Is it personnel? What are you seeing out there that we're seeing all these crazy games, and it's not just with your team? Yeah, I think that's you – know, Greg, I always talk about college football as a whole because I – I don't have the opportunity to watch as many games as the, most people, um, but I do think it's like a reflection of what is occurring. And so much of the history of football is reciprocal, right? There, whether it was you know teams forever running the old you know three down defense, like why are we seeing more of that? And then you're seeing more of these three three fives to take away RPOs, and then you're seeing offenses that are more up tempo and less huddle, right? And then more. Um, I think what's happened is you're seeing so many creative scheme designs by these offenses, so many of them trying to push the label play fast. Sometimes it puts your defense in a bad situation. Um, I always say, like, is, are the defenses in the Big Ten? And no knock on, and I have not studied the Big Ten by any stretch of the imagination, so I'm going to get quote tweeted or something. Um, but the defenses seem to play really well in that conference. Well, they're also look at, are they running the ball more? You know, and I go back to um, a, a quick study of like Stanford. Okay, when Stanford was running the ball 70% of the time, their defense was really good because of the clock and all those things. Uh, and I think you sit there and say, well, 
Yes, Stanford had some great defenses, right? My, my good friend Derek Mason was the D coordinator there before getting the head job at Vanderbilt. And, like, he, he was a great defense scorer, a great mind. But it also helped them that they were handing the ball off to some of those uh, Heisman-type candidates and, and running the ball and doing those things. When you start throwing it, well, your defense is back on the field for more plays. And you go, and our defense played over 90 plays. And that's a lot. Um, and, and so much of it is finding ways to get off the ball. And that being said, now more than ever, think about the aggressiveness of offenses on third and fourth down. More than ever in college football, we're seeing teams going forward on a fourth and one. Minus, anytime you're on this, this side of the 40, you'd say, no way, they're going to punt for the history of college football. But over the last five years, if, if, if we have the ball in the minus 39, it's fourth and one, you guys are all saying, well, I bet he goes for it. Because that's, but that wasn't even in the thought process five years ago. So now all of a sudden the, the play callers, the, the aggressiveness of these head coaches is more apt to, you know, maybe keep the offense on the field a little bit longer. And an interesting stat, and I actually, you guys know, I'm not huge into stats. So Charlotte is ninth in the country in time of possession. I said, okay, well, what, what does that mean? It's got to be something maybe near 40 minutes. At 32 minutes and like 47 seconds. We'll say, well, how can that be in a 60-minute game? How is 32 minutes and some odd seconds top 10 in the country? But that just goes to show you it's not like it used to be. Because you used to look at teams that were top in possession, it would be somewhere near 38, 39 minutes. And that seems like a team that could possess the ball for a long time. Well, more and more teams are coming closer to the median and saying, okay, wow, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. So I think um, that's all part of it, and it's unique to study. I don't know if it will change. Um, I think you're going to see some more teams that may just say, screw this, you know, let's play complimentary football and, and continue to huddle. I don't know if they put the microphones in the helmets. I know we had that conversation a couple weeks ago, if that changes some things. Um, but I, I do believe um, here at the University of Memphis, we've got to be strong in all three phases. And there's no head coach that sits there and says, hey, we're, I'm, I'm just going to focus on this and let the rest of it be. Um, maybe there's some that <laughs> on the outside, that's what they do. Um, but we've got to be great in all three phases, and I firmly believe that. Uh, it still takes defense to win championships. I imagine when Tevin comes to the game Saturday, you guys keep it relatively simple for him. If he were to be the starter this week, could we see more? We've heard about his athleticism with QB run game and unleashing some of that. Um, so we'll give him the full complement of the playbook because he's now uh, another year in the system, and he's extremely intelligent. Um, but, yeah, not to give away what we're doing schematically, I mean, we're – yeah, I want Charlotte to have to prepare for a bunch of different things because uh, Seth's a good athlete, but uh, Tevin is also 230 plus pounds and uh, he can run. I've clocked him very fast on my uh, 40 time myself. And uh, so, it, it, yeah, it's going to present some different challenges, hopefully, to our opponent. We're, we're so used to on our side of the ball, uh, on our defense, having to say, which quarterback is it? And Charlotte's one example. I mean, they've got two different quarterbacks that go in and one uh, they expect to be you know, their runner, one they expect to be their passer, and that, that causes headaches and issues. You know, you're not just sitting there saying, okay, we get to prayer for this type of offense. So, uh, but we'll, we'll give Tevin the full reign on the playbook because he's intelligent enough to handle it, and um, he's calm, cool, and collected like the terms I've been able to use for Seth. And, uh, but, yeah, we'll see if we, it changes some of the things we can do offensively. Is there an update on Jonathan? Yeah, day-to-day uh, -to -day as well. You know, I mean, it's one of those. Um, he was out there with the team yesterday at, at practice. Um, it's just – to see, you know, is he close enough where he can be able to go? And if he does, does that mean we shuffle our offensive line back to how it was a few weeks ago? We'll see. Uh, you talked about a couple weeks ago when we asked you about Trent Dilfer, but Biff obviously is a kind of unique hire. I'm curious what you made of it at the time and then, like, having watched them, is it surprising what anything that he's done there? No, I mean, look, he's going to do it his way. I don't know him uh, individually. I've got to shake his hand and have a brief conversation with him at our coaches' meeting. Um, he does do it his own way. and. and I give people credit that in this day and age, um, you know, so, so many people are worried about what the outside perspective of him is. Um, you know, he, he can wear a cutoff shirt and, and shorts and, and carry it at a game. I, I can't do that, you know, I mean, and not, not, not that I would, but, um, and I don't think he frankly gives a darn way by thinks. And, and, and kudos to him for being able to do that. He's also was a very, very successful businessman. Um, so he knows how to run an organization at a high level. Um, you know, I know that they, um, you know, that they have a decent amount of NIL money uh, that they've spent on this roster, and I think that's one of the reasons why you're, you're seeing some of those names. They're like, wow, how'd they end up getting that guy? 
Um, but look, they, they do a good job, and he's getting them to do it the right way. And I think, you know, this past game, I think he made some, you know, some personnel changes based off of um, whether it may be behavior, whether it be um, attitude, whatever he needed to see differently. And clearly, it worked for them. And so he's standing his ground and doing it his way. And um, I think more and more head coaches are saying, well, how is this going to be perceived by other people? And for me, right, like, I, I, I've been off social media. I don't, no offense, I, like I told you guys, I can't wait to read all the beautiful articles you guys wrote about us after the season um, in January by the fireplace. But, you know, it, it's refreshing just because you just get to focus on your team. And I think that's for him. I think he, he's just going to do it his way. And, and credit to him. And, um, yeah, wish more head coaches and more people are like that. I know the, sorry, but after the past game, you said that this receiving core you would put up against in secondary and then it's double A. Is this the best receiving core you've coached? Oh, look, we've had some studs, you know, so now we'll make sure that one's out there. I mean, look, guys like Anthony Miller, I mean, phenomenal. Uh, Anthony Miller will go down as one of the all time greats. Um, you know, you look at. Oh, well, I know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Calvin is, I mean, is still doing it at a very high level in the NFL, and, and you guys know how close Calvin and I are and, and what he meant to this program. Um, I just think we're just seeing a variety of different guys, and I think what happened was over the years sometimes it was, hey, who are we relying on? And we've had so many tremendous wide receivers. I mean, I didn't coach him, but the first name that comes to my mind is, man, Isaac Bruce, like, gosh darn. And so many great wide receivers have come through Memphis. Uh, this is a good group. Um, and I'm, I'm not into comparing and contrasting because if that ever happens, you know, you get yourself into trouble, not only with your current players, but former players. I always give credit to the old heads. They, they're always going to be better. And, uh, you know, 10 years from now, let, let Rock and those guys challenge me on that stuff. But uh, it's a good, solid group, and, and they're doing it at a high level right now. I knew you were going to feel for any of your players when they get hurt, but with your quarterback, the relationship you have with him, and in the middle of, like you said, maybe his best game of the season, does that add to it, like the sense that you feel for him a little bit? Uh, I, I always feel feel injuries are part of the game of football um, you're in it long enough you see it happen um, some that are hey they go back in the game a few plays later uh, some are season ending and some are career ending um, you know I, I think Seth will be back sooner than later I don't know when um, but yeah you, you, you always but he's a, a, t a tough young man um, that's going to give it everything he has and just like with any of our guys we've had guys that have um, you know Davion Ross a young man that was had high expectations for him through the year and then, you know, has all major surgery and is done for the year. And you feel for a young man like that who, you, they work so hard. And I think that's part of it is any of these guys. And um, it's interesting because someone sent, people send me stuff and someone talked about Shane Beamer not apologizing for his team celebrating in the locker room after a win. And people are like, well, why are they celebrating? They just barely beat a, a, an opponent. And he's like, you guys don't understand how hard these guys work. And so to me, I've seen the investment that every single one of these guys put in, and they, they pour their heart and soul into it. So whether it's a Seth Hennigan, a Davion Ross, any of these guys, um, you just feel, man, they, they've worked their tail off um, to put themselves in a situation to go have success. And if it, when it's an injury that does it, I mean, you, you do feel for them, um, but it's my job just to not necessarily feel sympathy for them, but to encourage them and be there for them and, and continue to love them and push them and, and challenge them so they can get better and um, and be there for him in, in any way, shape, or form. And to your point about offenses going forward on fourth down, how much more difficult does that make the play calling defensively on like a third and five when it would usually be a pass, but now it, it, it could be a run? Absolutely. I mean, third and five all the time, right, it was always a pass. Now if, if that ball is close, closer to even your own 40, good chance it's a handoff. One, because they think maybe you're in pass defense, too, because if they get you to fourth and one or fourth and two, they're going to get another play call. And so as a defensive play caller, you sit there and say, okay, one, is this a possible four down territory? And if it is, then that's going to affect my third and five uh, decision, my play call. And, I, I, and it's, it's getting harder and harder. I think that's, um, you know, it's, it's sexy to be an offensive guy. But, like, man, the, the, it puts a lot of stress on these defensive players and the, the coaches because there's so many unknowns, right? Offense, you don't get in three downs, you're punting the ball away, or you're going for it, you could be more aggressive. But as a defensive guy, you don't know what the offense is thinking when they're going. So, so often I, what I'll do is I'll try to study the opponent's offense and say, okay, guys, this is four-down territory for them. They, they, you know, watch out for the handoff on a third and eight even. 
um, or hey, I, I, this kicker's field goal range pregame. Um, you know, he's a 45 yard and in guy. Um, so when all of a sudden be ready because now they may hand the ball off on this third and 10. Or hey, they're, they're going to run a screen here, but based off of what they've shown. And so I think it, it puts the defense in tougher situations. Um, but that's the name of the game, and we're going to continue to adapt and overcome. I also think one of the things we did uniquely, Frank, this off season in the spring and even uh, in training camp and even during the season is you always have third down periods, right? Everybody's got here's our third down period versus the defense. Here's the yeah. Now, all right, let's put the ball at the minus 42 and let's do a fourth and four period. You know. Oh, they're going to go for it. Or let's do a two down play, it, right? It's a third and four at the 40 yard line. Okay. The next play is going to play it as the guy lies. So now all of a sudden you have to get a different call in your head. And uh, it's, it's difficult. Thanks, guys.